Good morning and welcome to today's webinar co-hosted by Align and the Growth Institute. Today's topic is how to evolve from entrepreneur to CEO with Daniel Marcos, the CEO of Growth Institute. We'll leave time at the end for question and answer, but feel free to submit any questions at any time using the Q&A feature. All right, now to introduce our distinguished guest. Daniel Marcos is the co-founder and CEO of Growth Institute, the leading online executive education company for C-level executives and fast-growing firms. He's a keynote speaker and a CEO coach with the mission to help one million entrepreneurs scale their companies faster and with less drama. He is the founder and main contributor of CapitalEmprendedor.com, a website dedicated to helping entrepreneurs in Spanish-speaking markets scale their businesses. Additionally, Daniel is the CEO of XO Education in partnership with Salim Ismail and serves as the ambassador of Singularity University in Austin, Texas. He is a member of both YPO and EO. Daniel is a graduate of EO's premier CEO program, Birthing of Giants, and its continuation, Gathering of Titans. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Industrial and Systems Engineering from ITESM and an MBA, cum laude, from Babson College in Wellesley, Massachusetts. Thank you for joining us, Daniel. So we're going to talk about the company in three points of view. One of them is how the company has to evolve from, let's say, a baby to an adult. Uh, uh, and then how do we entrepreneurs have to evolve uh, to be able to grow our businesses? And then the third part is how their employees are going to see themselves in the company, how your team members see themselves in the company on the four stages. But just before I start, one thing is very important. I've realized that I am the bottleneck in my company. So if my mindset or my knowledge is here, the maximum I'm able to grow my company is here. I won't be able to go above that. If my company begins going faster than me or growing faster than me, I'm gonna kill my company in a certain way for not allowing it to, to go faster or grow faster. And in a certain way, that is what's happening politically around the world that the, move, the world is moving globally really fast in technologically really fast. And the people of the population that are not feeling comfortable with that are saying, hey, I'm going to vote to stop the growth. I'm going to be a nationalist and really stop because I don't feel comfortable. Same thing happens with companies. If we, the company is growing faster than the management team, the management team begins feeling uncomfortable and begins stopping or like hijacking the growth of the company. So it's very, very important that the team that you have, you and your mentality and your team is growing faster than your company to be able to grow it. And we become usually the bottlenecks of the company. All right. So first, if you look at the most successful companies in the world, Apple and stuff like that, you will see it takes them 25 years to really scale. So Apple took 25 years to really get to 9,600 employees. Not bad. Not, uh, don't, don't take it wrong. Very respectful what they have done up to 9,600 employees. But, but they, they were not the trillion dollar company that are today. Something happened around the 2000 that did a change. And that's when Steve Jobs came, came back and talks about the iPhone, launches the iPhone, and then the rest is history. But companies really take a long time to really explode. So if you have your company for less than 25 years, you still have time. Just focus on doing it right uh, for a long term. The one thing that I would like to mention here is most entrepreneurs or CEOs, we see a strategy one, two, maximum three years in our company. If we just have a vision for two or three years, that would not be enough. We have to look much, much farther than that to really be able to grow our company and be a dominant player. Uh, Starbucks, same, same issue, 25 years to 60,000 employees, and then you had explosive growth to 182 uh, employees in 15 more years uh, from 60. Same thing, 25 years. is magical what happens whenever you're growing and learning and improving your systems, by the way, for that. And indeed, let me show you one more thing here. The average revenue per employee of a mid-market company in the U.S. is between one hundred dollars to $120,000 uh, revenue per employee. In Mexico, same company does around 50 to 60, so half of that. Public companies, Fortune 500, the average revenue per employee is a million dollars. Why? Systems, procedures, branding, everything they've been developed for so many years to get to wherever they are. So it's, it's really, really important that we understand the importance of the time 
and a human being being focused on one thing for a very, very long time. Human beings usually underestimate what we could do in the long term, but overestimate what we think we could do in the short term. So it's really important to first have a long-term vision. And the best framework I've seen for long-term vision, uh, Dan Sullivan, he's an American uh, coach, lives in Toronto, Canada, and he teaches several frameworks. This is a framework that I really like, the 25-year framework, and that's how I used to think of my company. So it's a really good read and really understanding uh, uh, the future. The main thing about it is if you have 25 years, you have four quarters per uh, year. So that means you have 100 trimesters or quarters. So you have 100 quarters to accomplish your goal. If you knew you had 100 quarters, how strategical would you be with your company? And today, because we just are looking at our company one, two, or three years, we want to do everything in a quarter. And that's killing our strategy long term. All right. So let's understand how companies grow in stages. And I divided the company or, or the stages in four. Start up, grow up, scale up, and then you start dominating your industry. So let, let's go deep into the four stages. Uh, this is how I'm going to see stages as a company. Let me go deep into each one. And by the way, I will talk about the amount of employees in each stage, not revenue per stage. Revenue changes depending on the economy. But most importantly, what brings the complexity of a company is the amount of employees that you have. So let's talk about the stages on the amount of employees. So stage number one, let's say the startup. Uh, number of employees, one to five, the entrepreneur is everything, right? And your most important thing you have to do, the focus is really product development. You have to validate your business model. What, what are you selling? Who are you selling it to? What price? What channels? What communication? You have to really validate that you have a business model. Uh, of course, the barrier that doesn't allow you to do this is market dynamics. You really need to understand who are the players, how they compete to each other and all that. And then the ability you have to develop as a leader is marketing. And for me, marketing is a communication way between you and your potential market. And you tell them what you want to sell them and they tell you what they're willing to pay and how much are willing to pay. So that's what will allow you to have a fast testing and communication and really validate your business model. And the decision, um, going back to scaling up the four decisions uh, of the scaling up model, it's all about strategy. That's what you have to do, your one-page plan. People have a business plan before they start. There's no business plan that could handle a new client or, or showing it to clients. Once you begin showing it to clients and you really understand the market, you have to significantly read, uh, adjust your strategy to reality. And this is the stage you have to do it. Then stage two, six to 15 employees more or less. Now focus is 100% on sales. Why? Now you have a fixed expense you have salaries, now you have some inventory, uh, you have uh, like phones and technology and everything, and you have to feed that operation. And if you don't pay payroll or something you missed a month, uh, the company is gonna go under. So the most important thing is that you have the cash that you need in the company. Um, Vern says, my, my mentor says, this is the stage where the entrepreneur ages the most. Uh, if you see an entrepreneur um, from stage one to stage three, they look considerably older. Uh, on stage three is because they went through stage two. Uh, usually have a lot of cash flow issues. Um, so the priority is really hire the right team. In stage one, you don't choose your employees. Your employees choose you. You don't have the salaries, the, the branding, the market dominance for them to, to really want to work for you. So you really have to hire whoever allows to be hired on the first stage. On second stage, now you begin to have people that are specialists in certain subjects. And now you have a salary, you have a better brand, you really begin building a company. Now you have to be more strategical uh, on the people that you hire. Then number three is the barrier is leadership. Now you don't have to be an entrepreneur and do everything. Now you have to lead a team. And for you to be able to lead a team, you have to delegate and start putting uh, repetitiveness and prediction. You begin building systems and procedures. Very manual, but that's when you start building systems and procedures for your team to do things in a certain way. And if you go back to scaling up, the most important decision you have to take on stage number two is really a team, understanding what's the right team that your company needs, and then cash. Get the cash that you need to grow your company. Uh, third stage, that's when you begin scaling up. And for me, that's the right stage to scale. Before 16, 20 employees, you're too small to scale. You're prematurely scaling the company. 
that's kind of the basic of the amount of people that you need in a company to really have all the like accounting and finance and operation and all the departments that you need uh, in the company. So what's the focus here? Start defining the industry. The pros that you bring, the marketing you do, now the competitors begin looking at you. There's so many companies in stage one, stage two, that the big companies don't even look at them, said, no, they're too small. They haven't even get it. Once you cross the third stage, now they realize you could become a competitor. So now they begin attacking you directly, and that's where you have to begin defining the industry. Priority, now it's scaling. That's when you have to really begin putting uh, fuel on the fire to really grow it. And the biggest barrier to scale is infrastructure. Most of your systems and procedures on stage one and two are done manually. Now you begin putting a lot of speed in your uh, systems and procedures. You begin putting a lot of uh, clients going through them. And now you have the manual and clunky. You'll be a really bad experience. You have to align them and simplify the pros and systems to be able to put the right infrastructure and be able to run them faster. So stage number three, scaling up, let's say, it's all about execution and focus and alignment. It's really, really important that you're able to get all the drama, concentrate in very, very few things, concentrate in doing one or two things really, really good, and be able to execute that much, much faster. And here's where you invest in infrastructure to make that wheel go really, really fast. People said, hey, whenever I start scaling, that's when the wheels of the boss begin falling. Um, so the best stage for you to scale is stage number three. 16, 20 employees, that's when you have the base. Now that's when you start growing. So an example, in my company today, I have 32 employees uh, in Growth Institute. We could be doing two or three times more revenue than what we're doing today. But now we have covered all the basics of the company. We have people that are experts in every division of the company that we need. Um, and here's where functional org charts are very, very important on stage three. By the way, as an entrepreneur, I hate organizational charts. I want to tell my team whatever I want them to do at the time that I want. But for them, it's very, very important to understand where they are in the organization, who they report to, what, are the, what, what, are, what things are they accountable for. So here's where you have to really begin setting the structure of your business not just working in your business, working on your business. And here is the typical functional org chart that you have in a company. First thing I do, I turn around. Uh, if I see the org chart like this, it looks like I'm the boss and they are below me and they have to do whatever I want. The real leaders on stage three understand that they're here to serve their employees and their employees are here to serve their clients. So if you turn the org chart around, now you're more service oriented and you change humility in the team. Now my role as a CEO with whatever I call my CEO team, and I'll show you a slide of that uh, in the future. My role is to have a great head of finance, is to have a great head of sales, is to have a great head of marketing. If I have a great head of marketing, how many marketing problems I'm going to get? Zero. Why? He's going to do great. If I have a weak leader, then I'm going to have to have all, to fix all the problems in the back. So my role is for me to build a great team and for them to be great. Now the company is not about me. It's about them. It's about them being successful. And the more successful they are, the more successful they're going to make my company and my clients. And that way I'm happy. So it's really, really important to turn around and really change the mentality that we're all here to serve our clients. So this is Growth Institute Functional org chart uh, as an example. Um, we follow two trends uh, in our org chart. Uh, we follow Team of Teams uh, by General McChrystal. Is the way the, um, the Special Forces of the US run today. Uh, it's extremely efficient model of operation. So we run Team of Teams. Uh, Google has come up with a lot of studies around this uh, recently of how teams grow and move more dynamic and faster within each other. And then we study a lot about holacracy, this very um, functional lateral organization. And this is what we came up with. So let me kind of give you a, a, a think process of how we do it. And it's been a great way of uh, people to understand where they are and what's the flow of the company and the client. So first, we have a direction team or a CEO team. And it's a team, it's not just me. I have a team of people 
that we have meetings uh, together and we do take the leadership of the company or do the leadership of the company. But also there's one thing that for us is very important, what we call the thought leader hunter and R&D. We're an education company. We treat with a lot of thought leaders like Vern and Salim and all these very important thought leaders, very famous around the world. That has to be led uh, through us directly. So the relationship with them and, and who do we work with and all that, we do it here. But there's a couple of very important uh, positions. We have an execution leader. Uh, it's my head of operations, uh, my integrator, uh, Ross Schott. So Ross and I designed the strategy and then I executed externally in the company and Ross executed internally in the company. So we're kind of co-CEOs and each one runs, I run the company on the outside and he runs it on the inside. There's a lot of things we have to do on the outside that I take responsible for that. He's responsible for the operation to run for the day to day. And then we have here what we call an HR leadership. We have someone on our team, it's at our level, and she's a coach for us to help us coach the rest of the team uh, to be great. So we have HR divided in two. We have an HR leadership and a C at the CEO level or direction level. And then inside finance, we have an accounting or, or operational HR, whoever pays payroll and, and contracts and all the rest. So this is the, the team that really leads the company. But then we are gonna see it on how the client sees it. First, once we sign up an, an author, a thought leader, let, let's say we go with Vern Hardy and say, hey Vern, want to do a class with you? He said, yes, we want to do it. We negotiate the terms, we sign a contract, and then we send it to the content team. And we have a girl here called Karina. Karina is in charge of the content team, and she's in charge of developing the tools and the course and everything that we're gonna sell and teach to our clients, right? That's it. So they create, they partner with a leader and they create the content. Then they send it to the growth team. And the growth team has to do two things, what we call acquisition and monetization. Acquisition is to build a community to bring people that give us their name and email address to start a conversation with them. And then we have a team that is called monetization and their role is to monetize that, uh, that community. Uh, and that's what we call the growth team. And their role is to grow the company. And then we have what we call the success, uh, customer success team. Once someone buys from us on this, uh, from the growth team, then the client is sent to here. And then we have another leader here, here called Sam. Say is in charge that you have a great experience once you buy one of our classes or enroll in one of our coaching programs. His job responsibility is to make sure that everyone that bought really get whatever we tell them we're gonna, uh, that we're gonna get, and they really have a great experience. And here as an example, the most important KPI that we have is completion rate. When someone buys a class online, the completion rate around the world, the average is 15%, one five. In the typical MOOCs, it's 3%. For us, it's 70, 75% completion rate. That's why this team exists, to make sure that someone comes and then uses what they bought from us. And then we have what we call the support team, finance, technology, logistics, brand design, and the rest. Uh, this is how we run our team, and it's been amazing for the team to understand where they are, how, what's the flow of the uh, clients, for them to really understand how, what they have to do in each of the, of the stages. And then stage four, how to really uh, grow over 250 employees. Now the, the main focus is dominate the industry, this is the first time you've been talking about percentage um, uh, of market share that you have in the company. What's a priority? Consistently reinvent yourself. Why? You get into a comfort zone. Now you have clients, everyone's getting a fat salary. Uh, the founders begin buying houses of summer, taking two or three months on the summer, and things begin to get into a comfort zone that is really, really dangerous. So the most important thing is that you, have, you become the change catalyst of the organization help the company to uh, adapt and, and change consistently to the new trends and really be able to evolve consistently. And going back to the four decisions, these are the four decisions. You have to rotate your folks in each of the four decisions every quarter, every six months. All right, now that's how the company grows. Now let's understand the leader of the company. How do you have to evolve from entrepreneur to CEO? So on stage one, you're everything in the company. You're the entrepreneur, you do the administration, you do the accounting, you pay taxes, you do the technical work. Um, like we used to do courses or we do courses. 
I was recording the thought leaders and I was in front of the camera doing all of that. I was doing everything. Like you, you sell, you buy, you do accounting, you even wash the, the bathroom in, in your office. That's normal, right? So you have to understand that there's three technical or, or, or fundamental mindsets you need to have in your company. The technical, the administration entrepreneur, and the entrepreneur has to do the three of them. Then they grow up, the second stage. Now you're a leader of one-to-one. -one, and there you have to delegate and define direction. You have to be very, very good with communication to really clearly explain the communication to, to the team of what you have to do and everything and be able to delegate what each one has to do. And then stage three, scale up. And this is the most important stage to really be able to scale your company in your change of mentality. Now it's not about you. It's about them. What does allow usually a leader to go from stage two to stage four is ego. They have to let go. They have to understand the company is not about them. It's about their team. The best leaders in the world work for their team. So they, when, you, when you're talking to them, they're always thinking, how can I grow my team? How can I give them the tools they need? What do I need to do today to be a better leader for them? And just help them to be great and successful. For that, you have to be a much better communicator. Why? Because if I'm the leader here and I say something to this leader, now this leader is going to tell it to the rest of the team. There's going to be the, the typical uh, phone uh, game. Whatever I tell them, he's going to distortion the communication to the rest of the team. So I have to be extremely good communicating for the communication to go uh, uh, past every or every uh, stage or, 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 or level of the organization all the way to the frontline employees. Design course of action. I have to coach my leaders for them to design their departments, their strategy, and help them do it better. Then team building. It's all about helping them run their department as efficient as possible, but also working with other departments. That's where companies begin working in silos and you get all the political problems that you have in the company. So it's very, very important that you help team building and helping them all work in a team. And then coaching. You have to stop being a boss. You have to change your mentality to be a coach and not coaching your team and help them be successful, help them being better. And then you dominate your industry. Now you become a satellite around the organization and the organization runs effectively without you in the day to day. But you're there to be strategic innovator, change catalyst and chief of culture. You have to make sure that the core values and the culture that you build in your company is respected. Uh, whenever your employees are talking with a client or executing one of your uh, products or services, they're executing with the quality and the culture that you design in your business. So the only way to do that is having very, very clear core values, over communicating them, and be really, really good with culture. And then that will allow you to have a lot of time to think and to read and to travel and talk with clients. So you have to be strategic innovator of the new systems you have to bring to the company, the new markets the company has to grow to, uh, the new trends you have to make sure uh, you're taking advantage and make sure the company is changing and evolving uh, fast enough. So one thing that I've learned uh, that has significantly helped me do that is deliberate practice. Uh, and this is something I learned from, from Vern, but then the how-to I learned a lot from Dan Sullivan here in Toronto. Um, so remember uh, Malcolm Gladwell in the book Outliers said, hey, you have to do something 10,000 hours to be great at that. Perfect, yes. But you could do something 10,000 hours and still do it wrong. You have to have deliberate practice to make it better. And the best way to have deliberate practice, having a coach or someone guiding you how to do it better. And for me, that's why the books. Um, I've realized that every problem or opportunity I have in my business, someone else already had that problem or that opportunity and figure out a way to do it, wrote the methodology about it, and then wrote a book about it. So my role is really understanding what problem I'm having, what's the best methodology to be able to fix it, understand the methodology, and then implement it and have someone guiding me to implement that. And that's a deliberate practice. Um, I've learned that whenever I try to do something on my own, without deliberately trying to get better, without a methodology, some guidance, my progress is gonna be very, very slow. If I want to do very fast progress, 
I need to have a methodology, a model, a system that I'm following, and then having someone coach me or helping me go through the process. And then the process is going to go much faster and the innovation or the improvement is going to be much, much faster. And this is the formula that I follow uh, to do that. And people say, hey, I don't, I'm, I'm not going to do anything new until I'm not confident that I'm going to do it. And you think the confidence is going to arrive to you just magically? No, you have to develop that confidence, that trust. How do you do that? And I follow a four-step formula for that. First is commitment. Uh, I have to commit to the world, to my family, to my team members, to my wife. I'm going to do something. Hey, I'm going to lower, but I'm going to lose 20 pounds. And everything starts with a commitment. Once I have a commitment and I tell everyone around me, that's going to give me the courage to get out there and figure out a way to do it, waking up early, going to the gym, everything that I have to do, that's going to give me the courage to go out and do it. And the more I begin doing that, that's going to give me some new capacities that are going to help me do it better. Like I go to the gym, I begin learning, I begin learning more, having more capacity. I hire a, a personal trainer. The personal trainer teaches me how to use the best exercise or the best way to do an exercise to do it right and lose the most weight. And that builds a lot of trust. And then that trust allows me to have a higher commitment and then more courage, capacity, trust. And then you go over all of this. If you follow the model uh, consistently, that gives you breakthrough. I love this model uh, to follow through because it allows me to start with a commitment uh, and then getting all the process to trust. And then that commitment goes way higher. Once I achieve something, I feel so confident that I could do that. I have so much trust that I could do it that I usually put a much higher commitment and a much higher commitment. So whenever we're talking about we have to grow faster than our companies, following the model allows me to follow faster so I could grow my, my company uh, with me. And the most powerful thing I've learned to do that is the morning ritual or routine. I wake up two hours before my kids. My son usually wakes up at 6.30 or so. I try to wake up at 5 or 4.30 if I can. Today I woke up at 4 a.m. And I do some exercise in the morning. I read a little bit. I like to hear some music for some uh, empowerment and stuff like that. Uh, I sometimes do two or three emails that I have that are very, very important with investors and things like that. So I take the first two hours of the day to have a great morning for me. Uh, if I wake up at 7 a.m. with the alarm and, and I rush to the door, quick, uh, quickly give breakfast to my kids, rush them to school, and then go to the office, then my day is going to be really hard. I need two hours for me every morning for me to have a great morning and have a center on my day. Once I have dedicated two hours for me, then the rest of my day usually goes really, really well. And that's where I read, I think, I define my commitments, and that's where I go through my process. Right, and just to finish, levels of management, this is how your employees see themselves in the, uh, in the four levels of the organization. And you're always gonna have employees on these four levels. If you're on stage three, you have employees on three levels. If you're on stage four, you're gonna have them the four levels. So level number one, individual contributor, frontline employees. Teach them or help them be better on their technical know-how. If they're in sales, teaching them sales. If they're in customer support, teach them customer support things like that. Focus. They're going to have to do one thing repetitively all the time. So help them, allow them to focus. If you're all the time having all these distractions, it's very, very difficult for them to do that. So allow them to be focused on doing one thing and help them with that focus. Productivity. Focus them on having results, not just giving you man hours. Said, well, I worked 10 hours today. I don't care about the hours. I care about the results. I, want, I care about how productive you are. So help them be focused on giving results. And then humbleness and cultural fit. Your frontline employees are talking with your clients all the time. They have to have the right culture of your business and the right core values to really be able to serve your clients. So whenever I have a frontline employee, these are the things that I'm focusing myself to help them be better. Stage number two, now they're a leader. And for them, they have to first learn how to listen. Um, on, on the first stage, usually they say things they're all the time doing. Now they have to learn how to listen, 
how to step aside back and begin listening and understanding what's going on. Begin to understand patterns or recognition or, or, or performance. I need to understand from their employees, who's doing great, what are they doing, what's giving results, becoming a little bit more analytic of what's going on in their department. Start to think and understand how to build a high performance team uh, and then talent development. How are they gonna grow their team? Being a leader is all about growing them, not growing you. So I want to change your perspective on themselves being focused on them, on growing them, on them growing their team. And the more they grow their team, the more they're gonna grow. So it's a completely change of mentality. Now, third stage leaders, departmental managers, now they have to be more critical on who's the right person to the right position. They're much more strategical. So the way I explain stage two and stage three, or level two and level three, level two, they're playing checkers. Level three, they're playing chess. So whenever you're playing checkers, you look at your board and every chip that you have is exactly the same color and the same size. And you have full control of what happens on the checkers board. Whenever you're playing chess, you look at your board and say like, wow, I have different pieces and each one has strengths and weaknesses. As the leader, I have to put them on the right position for them to use the strengths the most and with the rest of the team, cover the weaknesses as much as I can. So level three management or leadership is a much more strategical position at level two. So I, I walk them through that process of leadership, how to develop other leaders, begin understanding the big picture of the department with other departments and predictability skills, how to build systems and procedures for the team to follow those systems and procedures. And then stage four, it's all about people. Um, uh, we're all in the people business. So I teach them how to really understand people, change management, Global vision, now the company with other companies in the market, and then how to do innovation. Remember, change catalyst, help them with innovation and change management into the company. And those are the VPs or the C-level executives. So in the athletic world, we're a big stu uh, students of the sports teams. They execute much better than management teams. So we love to learn how they do it, how they learn, how they get better, and get a lot of that and bring it to the, to the management team, the business management teams. So athletes spend 90% of their team training and learning new techniques to then be able to execute the other 10% at the highest level. So if you want to really, really perform well, you have to train a lot and learn a lot. So in business, we do the opposite. We usually perform 99% of the time, and then with 1% of the day learning, we want to go back and execute great. That doesn't happen. You really have to bring a discipline of learning and practice to your organization for your organization to become better. If, and this is something I learned that I was, I was uh, it really dawned on me. The people that we pay the most in the world are people that practice a lot. Speakers, uh, artists, uh, sports, uh, People that practice and practice and practice, and they perform very little of their time. But when they're performing, they give so much value that they get a lot of money for that performance value. So if you really want to take your paycheck and your company revenue to the next level, practice, 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 and learn, learn, learn. If you do that, you're gonna separate consistently from the competition. So if you want to 10X your business, first you have to 10X you, and your team to be able to grow. And that's for me, the most important thing you have to learn and, and do to be able to take your company to the next level. And that you will become, go from entrepreneur to a CEO. Instead of working in your business, you're gonna work on your business, the typical uh, mentality. All right, uh, so that's it. That's what I had uh, for today. Um, uh, Rene, Henry, uh, or anyone, happy to have any Q&A uh, or respond to any questions that people have. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I think we have time for a couple questions. Um, people can feel free to still submit them through the Q&A tool. Um, just to start it off, you talked a lot about what you look for in uh, employees at each level. Um, and I know that at scaling companies, a big thing is how do you attract those employees? So what are some effective strategies that you've seen for finding and recruiting A players um, at the different stages? So um, 
very early, I learned about top grading and I became a, a big, big student of top grading and, and a follower. Uh, it's a very rigorous process of hiring uh, and all that. And I really learned that the hiring process is not just the interview. It's, it's a much wider, um, uh, since you begin looking for the people, the, the brand, the culture of your business and everything. And then after you hire someone, it's a 90 day process after to keep them happy and give them everything they need to become successful in the company. But the one thing that I learned in hiring, not necessarily on top rating, um, that has made a very, very big impact in my company. The second thing you sell in every business is your culture. So I focus a lot on building a great culture and a really great brand. And that will make the most, uh, best, the best candidates in the market wanting to work for us, wanting to know who we are and wanting to be part of that. That will be start to attract the best. If the best, if you're not attractive for the best, you will never going to be able to hire them. You have to make an organization that is really, really attractive for them to want to come on. And that's all about culture. The second thing every company sells is their culture. All right, here's another one from uh, Al Gangani. If you have two partners, one is CEO and one is president, how do you effectively, how do you execute effectively to avoid duplication? So, um, for me, let me go back here. Let me go to the orchard. So that's what, what I call my execution leader. Um, and for me, the CEO, it's kind of a strategic uh, person looking into the trends and, and talking with strategic clients and all that. And they're executing uh, for the company on the outside. And the president should be looking into the inside and making sure everything runs smoothly. So, the president could be this execution leader uh, that runs the day-to-day, -day, and the CEO is the one more running the strategy and executing on the outside. And let me take a parenthesis here. Today, the CEO position has too many things to do. Usually, CEOs are extremely busy, and they, they don't have enough hours on the day. So if you really want to do everything well, you don't have enough hours. So I really break the CEO or whatever, the leader of the company position, I break it in two. And they both have to align on the strategy and define strategy correctly. And one's going to make sure that it gets executed internally. And one makes sure that it gets executed externally. And, and I see the president more as the operating, and I see the CEO as more as a strategist. Uh, I hope I was able to um, define that uh, uh, more clear for that. I'll, and now, if, if you want to uh, uh, say more of, or even take out your microphone, let's have a conversation if you want. Uh, but that's the way I see it. I, I, I don't know how you want to call each one, but one is more focused on the internal and one's more focused on the external. All right, and uh, one more question. So we talked a lot about planning for the future um, and what skills do you think the CEOs of tomorrow will need that they need to be working on today to prepare for that? So you know what, let me, I, I don't have a slide about this. Let me bring a slide that I think is very, very important. Give me one second. So uh, I'm a big student of Singularity University and, and technologies and trends. And when I tell people, hey, you have to think about 25 years, they say, you're crazy, it's impossible that with all the change in the world, I could do a strategy for 25 years. And I learned something from Peter Diamandis that is extremely important. Uh, let, me, let me try to look for the slide and share that slide. Um, but it's been a huge eye-opener for me. And I significantly have changed my business model once I understood that. Sorry, guys, give me one second. I didn't have that slide ready. Um, if you could bring another question, I'll come back. Uh, sure. That one. Um, so Devesh wants to know, uh, do you have any resources you could recommend about learning delegation and accountability? So the model that I have used the most is the three disciplines of execution of scaling up. Um, uh, it allows me to focus 
uh, all my team, every quarter, we meet for one or two days and we distill everything we're going to have to do, who's going to do what, what and by when, put some KPIs and put everyone focus on them. Let me show you a slide indeed here. Uh, before I go to the other slide uh, that I want to show uh, from Peter, um, let me show you this. So the dashboard that Scaling Up teaches. Um, one question, where's my dashboard? So there's a dashboard that I use a lot. Yeah, here it is. Let me show this. So if you're seeing this dashboard, right? There's five priorities of a company in a quarter. Uh, this is the person that is responsible for each one. And then these are all the tasks or individual priorities the team has to do to get these five things done, right? So if you look at this, which one, like how many problems the company have? Four problems, right? The four reds. How many potential problems the company has? Seven, that's the yellow ones, right? How, how are the rest things going? Well, that's a green and super green, they're going great. So if you look at this picture, very, very fast, you're gonna be able to identify problems, identify what's going work, what's working, what's not working. So if I see this, the second objective, this, it's the one that has the most danger of not being accomplished. Pauline is responsible. And out of the six things that has to be done, five are having problems or are in a potential big problem. So I will focus on fixing those five things. So when I start a meeting, instead of everyone reporting to the meeting, we get deep into understanding this. So when you follow the three disciplines of scaling up, you have to define the quarterly objectives and priorities who's going to do what and by when, you put KPIs, measurement of each one, and then people report on a daily and a weekly basis with colors of how they're doing with their company or their, their priorities. That will drive accountability so, so deep into the company and things makes things much, much easier for you uh, to run your company. So I love a dashboard like that. And I'm still looking for the slide. Um, Indeed, you know what? I'm going to show it in one second. I'm teaching a webinar after this in Spanish, but that slide, I think I have it in English, but I'll, I'll just show the slide. Um, here it is. So I'm teaching this class. Uh, where is it? Come on. Let me put it and then I'll bring it back. W whenever you start sharing, it's much lower. Um, we have one follow-up on the dashboard question. Um, yep. uh, for the dashboard, is that simple Excel or uh, do you have an app or something else that you use? I'm, I know it has some of that functionality. So Yeah, there's, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of softwares that do that. Uh, <laughs> like you're, you're a perfect uh, example of that. Uh, that's, that's, the most, that's the most designed software for the scaling up methodology. That's exactly precise design for scaling up methodology. So I strongly recommend, uh, indeed, you're, you're in the line. That, that's part of what you do with the line. Um, uh, indeed, Henry, you, have the, you guys have an energy map in the line. That's exactly what I show there. Priority map. Mm -hmm. The priority map. You could do that. That's exactly what I showed. The priority map of who's going to do what and by when. And guys, sorry, I'm going to show it in Spanish. I'll translate it. Uh, the slide. But this is Pierre Diamandis. Pierre Diamandis, the founder of Singularity University, uh, the founder of X Price, and one of the most important thinkers in technology in the world. And Peter t taught me this. Um, he said, "They pay me a lot of money to ask me one question." What's going to change in the future? And he said, but no one has paid me a dime to ask me what I think it's a more important question. What's not going to change in the future? If you're able to answer that question in your business, you could make a much, much easier 
and focus business. So as an example, if you see our, our logo, um, um, in our logo, it's scale impact and reduce drama. Every leader in a fast growing firm will always want to scale impact and reduce the drama of the operation. That's it. That's the two things that will give you freedom, that you're able to grow your company and grow your impact, have more clients, add more to the value, create more employment, all that. You want to have more impact and you want to reduce the drama of the operation so you could have a better quality of life. That's it. It took us six years to understand those two things. But once you have it right, it's really, really easy to focus a strategy on doing that. So as an example for us, what's our BHAG, our long-term 25-year plan, is to help 10 million leaders like you to be able to scale impact and reduce drama. If we're able to do that, great. We started doing with coaching, one-on-one -on -one coaching or company coaching. Then we went online to do courses. Now we're building an ecosystem for companies that they want to scale. That's what you need to do. That's exactly uh, what you need to do. Um, you understand what's not going to change and the trends and how you do it is going to change significantly. But the end goal will never change. Expand impact and reduce drama to 10 million liters. Great. All right. Maybe we have time for one more question. Um, so what is the best communication strategy uh, for solving the internal communication bottleneck, particularly in sales? So rhythm of meetings. Um, I, I, if there's one thing that I implement in a company to start scaling faster, is fixing the communication problem. And the communication problem, you have to have set timings and structures for communication. If you don't have a set structure or rhythm for communication, people are gonna have unstructured communication. And the communication is gonna be haphazard and not gonna be complete. So if you want to make sure you fix the communication problem, is getting a rhythm of communication with dashboards and KPIs. Dashboard like you see in a line, it will allow you to have clear communication, focus the team in whatever is important, and if it's not in the board, it's not important. Whatever they're doing that is not on the board, they should not lose any more time on that. And whenever you have everything on the board, that will allow that you don't have blind spots because everything that is important is in the board. So that's why you have a rhythm uh, and a software like Align that you could put that in your Align software to be able to have that communication. The one thing that kills meetings, when people come to the meeting to report, you have to report to the system. And after you report to the system, then you come and have a discussion on how to fix that problem. Whatever is gonna align the team to be I hope that I was able to answer your question correctly. Is there a follow-up on that? Um, I don't see one, so I think, think that answered it. Um, well, I think that's all the time that we have. Daniel, thank you so much for joining us. Um, to all the attendees, we'll send out a follow-up, um, but we'd love to get any feedback you have about this. Daniel, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I hope you all have a great rest of your Thursday and uh, keep scaling. Sounds great. Awesome. Henry, thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you for your time. Hey, Renee, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys.